That's lovely. Thanks very much. Well, welcome everybody to um, day two of Alt C Summer Summit, and we are in the first of the parallel sessions. And I'm really looking forward to um, to seeing what we've got on offer for you today. My name's Debbie Baff, and I'm the membership and professional development manager at Alt. And we have two sessions for you uh, with Sarah Copeland first, and then up afterwards that we've got Debbie, Holly, and David Biggins. So Sarah, I will be coming to you shortly, but I just wanted to um, double check. If anybody does have any difficulties with using Blackboard Collaborate, um, please do um, let me know. I'm just gonna go through these quick slides for you. I'm assuming that everybody's all Blackboard Collaborated out by now, and you probably know. <laughs> everything that you need to do um, but if you do need to access the chat you can get that from the bottom right hand corner there's a little purple chevron um, and that if you click that button that will allow you to access the chat and leave a, a message so you can ask questions in the chat and also comment um, Fiona and myself are in the background and we'll try and keep up with the chat and then we can ask your questions for you. If you do want um, the microphone, we can enable you to have that later on. But at the moment, um, they're all kind of stopped because they are large sessions. So it's just the chat that you have access to at the moment. Um, so uh, what I will do is I will um, close these uh, slides down and then I will move over to uh, Sarah and Sarah's gonna get ready and we'll just upload your slides for you, Sarah, and then you should have everything you need to get going and you can introduce yourself. I'm just going to pop you on there. There we go. And you should have control. <laughs> OK, That's so great. thanks, Sarah. Thanks very much, Deb. That's great. So hello, everyone, and thanks very much for coming to find out more about reflective pedagogies and how they can be used to support us. So I'm talking about colleagues, learners and ourselves as well and um, through this period of rapid change. And of course, even in ordinary times, change can be so unsettling. Um, but in the pressure cooker that we've just found ourselves in for the best part of the year, I think it's fair to say that at some point uh, we might feel the need to stop and take stock of where we are and what's changed in our everyday professional practice and how we've grown. Um, so I'm Sarah Copeland and I've worked with learning technologies my whole career actually. As an educational designer I've worked across the board in different aspects of post compulsory education and training. So I've been an academic and an educational developer working with learning technology and online course design. Um, my research area is around digital storytelling in particular context but I'm interested in the, the wider movement as well. Uh, and now I work as implementation specialist for an e-portfolio provider and I'm always looking out for synergies between the two different areas. So I'm actually going to turn off my camera. Oh, I don't even know if I can do that. <laughs> I don't even know if it's on. Um, so I imagine for all of us in the room reflective practice will be part of our daily work but how we record reflections will vary enormously of course. Um, one of the best ways to make sense of a new situation is to discuss it endlessly, I would do, with different people. And the opportunity for that has become massively reduced now that all of our meetings are online. Uh, and how many of you would want to stay on for an extra hour for a chat when you've had five back-to-back -back Zoom meetings already? You know, it's so tiring. It's, it's been really difficult. Oh, clicking in the wrong place. Sorry, I am a bit new to collaborate, so just bear with me. Um, so uh, in this session, we're going to explore how digital storytelling can act as a powerful sense making process collectively and also look at the value of cultural tools uh, around that. But also um, I'm interested in the processes of reflective practice and thinking about portfolio as a pedagogy, not, not only in our teaching practice, but, only, uh, for, uh, but also for our own sense making as well. OK, so the eminent psychologist Jerome Bruner describes narrative as both a mode of thought and, a, and an expression of a culture's worldview. And that's taken from his book, The Culture of Education, which is a really good read. And Bruner states that it's through our own narratives that we negotiate constructing a representation of ourselves in the world. And concurrently, it's through narrative that cultural representations of identity and agency are made. Identity, of course, being fluid um, as we move through experiences in time uh, to grow and develop. So social constructivism holds that learners are actively involved with their teachers and peers in co-constructing knowledge and it particularly recognises the importance of the situation in which learning is taking place uh, and in how that knowledge is constructed in that experience. 
And this epistemological understanding leads to learning and knowledge construction being seen as a social process. So therefore, um, I'm concluding here that telling stories help learners, all of us as learners uh, in life, to make meaning out of experience. Keep clicking the wrong place. There you go. So what are cultural tools? When considering the role of narrative within the context of culture and therefore our everyday lived experience, we use cultural tools to make sense of how our lives change over time. So the arts and creative practices provide us with a wealth of cultural tools through which um, we, we use them to make sense of the world. And it's important to remember these cultural tools change as our lives and communities do as well. Um, I thought the image was particularly timely. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I had to get it in there somewhere. Uh, actions can be fundamentally altered as a result of the transformations embedded in the development of cultural tools that the quote I've used there from one of the pieces of literature that um, I, I drew on for my PhD work around digital storytelling. Uh, and so what are these cultural tools? Well, in this context, of course, digital storytelling for reflective practice in a variety of settings is one such transformative tool for anything from personal, organisational and community development. And digital storytelling is described in the academic literature as valuable and notes that one outcome of sharing stories is that the sense of a community itself can be strengthened. So it's a really um, communal, engaging way to make sense of what's going on around us. From a community perspective, if we accept that narrative practices are social practices, that self-representation through narrative is constructed as a social process in relation to other people. One of the projects that I looked at in my research was around US teens. Um, and this, the researchers in this project recognized that participants were voicing their ag agentive selves. It was called the Dusty Project somewhere in the States. Um, and they were able to represent and reposition themselves, the storytellers that is, not only in reflecting the personal life, but critically commenting on it publicly. And that's one of the key things, using a platform such as a mediated, complicated um, uh, narrative can, can really take the sting out of the tail, I suppose. They further conclude that we cannot afford to neglect mediational means in educational practice, or quite simply, the gap we see in literacy levels and potential for achievement. It will widen if we don't do something about that. Now, that's sort of looking more at the educational side. Um, and benefits in society is of using this. Um, I'm just trying to paint a picture of how um, powerful, empowering digital storytelling, the methodology can be. Um, but it's a, a sort of a process that we ourselves go through as well. Um, and we've also seen the value in expanding these cultural tools nationwide in a particular project of note, um, which was called Capture Wales. Debbie, I don't know if you remember that. It was funded by the BBC probably around 15 years ago now. And um, teams of community media practitioners went around the whole country uh, working with localised groups of people to hear their stories and then be able to share their stories of life in these um, varying communities of place and uh, interest. So it's quite a it's quite a, a large understanding. Um, although I guess as time has moved on, um, we've moved much more into the realms of social media, um, and so it's much easier to have a platform for individual narratives now. Um, and cultural tools are springing up all over the place. I mean, just look at the um, how quickly TikTok took over, um, and sort of all the memes that were going around with that. But I mean, I don't do TikTok myself, but I have seen uh, clips from it. Um, the, the, the power that these platforms now have to sort of take these cultural tools more widely is just is quite astounding. But taking a step back and thinking about um, the, the methods behind how you can um, engender community conversations, doing an understanding uh, and sharing and breaking down challenging situations, which is particularly the, um, the, the whole point of this talk. Um, OK, I'm going to move on to the next slide, thinking about reflective practice. So uh, this isn't a session on how to write reflectively, obviously. Um, in our community of practice, reflection is a very important component of enabling learning. And hopefully we employ this technique ourselves, although we may not. Um, I've put another quote up there from Bruna, highlight the empowering nature of thinking about thinking or the power of reflection. And I've seen many great examples of how universities provide support on this practice, which is not 
taught in schools regularly. So it can be an alien concept to undergraduate learners coming in to university at the, in the beginning. And even to be honest, some programs don't really engage with it um, in the same way. Uh, so depending on your discipline, you might uh, not have much e exposure to it, I suppose. Um, and the same goes with staff members. You know, if you've if you've not engaged in formal learning programs that have required reflective practice as part of that development, then it may be something that you're just not comfortable or familiar with um, with doing. It's more than just writing a blog post. Obviously, it's the the deep thinking that goes on behind actions that have had how you're bringing it to the fore. Um, and I found this really great example from the University of Edinburgh. Um, they have the reflective toolkit available online. I put the link in there. Um, but you, you may well know it already. Um, and I really like the way that they, they start what, you know, what is reflective practice, the conscious examination of past experiences, thoughts and ways of doing things um, with a goal to surface learning about oneself and the situation and to bring meaning to it. And then, of course, to inform um, what happens going forward. So it's such a powerful process to immerse yourself in, having been through a particularly challenging period. So what is it? Is it a process or is it a product? This brings us to the, this question, and it's often the case that end products are the goal in time poor schedules. And in fact, Bruna describes the enemy of reflection as the breakneck pace. The end products can be really helpful, not only for those of you who share with, but with yourself as well. Um, the, you know, the success of creating something um, is, is very, uh, it's, it's a really great thing to do. But the process of getting there might be the thing that brings the desired effect, regardless of whether the product, cultural tool or otherwise, is shared. So it's so important um, that the, the process is given the primacy that it really needs for the, the real benefits to come out of this. And this was a crucial step in my PhD research where I was working with community groups to use digital storytelling as the mediator for sometimes difficult conversations in intergenerational groups. That was the context of my research. Um, but of course, that's relational to many other different learning contexts. I couldn't rely on my participants creating the artifacts or cultural tools under the ethical co code of engagement. So I had to evaluate the process alongside the product to ensure that I was always in control of an outcome of some nature. But the key point here is it's the taking part that's crucial to the end goal. For anyone who's undergone the process and the story development cycle, once that's been completed, the stories themselves can serve as objects which mediate relationships. And that's something else I've taken from the literature. OK, so before I move to the next screen, I'm actually going to do something. I hope that works OK, uh, although I'm not seeing the polling button here. Was that something I was supposed to tell you about, Debbie, beforehand? <laughs> no, nope, I was going to ask a poll. So maybe you could just put in the chat then. Um, here's my question. Are you aware of the difference between digital storytelling and digital storytelling method? There it is in there. <laughs> and I'd just be really interested to know, actually, um, because uh, as we'll go on to explore, it's quite ubiquitous, ubiquitous term. OK, so I'm getting a lot of no's from the, from the room. That's not surprising, but interesting, actually, that so many people <laughs> and perhaps someone that I have explained the difference to <laughs> before is the only person that knows. Um, OK. So if I move on to the next slide. So digital storytelling is an umbrella term that can mean at any level a combination of narrative, sorry, narrative and a digital platform. And I have heard it used for community radio shows and even digital photography where storytelling can be represented visually. Um, it's commonly used in a learning technology capacity to describe a general activity for students to engage with as an alternative presentation format uh, for developing ideas, often facilitated by software that allows photographs and video to play alongside text captions and musical soundtracks. Um, elsewhere in education, it can refer to e-portfolios, and it's also widely used to refer to many forms of polished media storytelling, uh, such as the type of adverts that um, that choke you up you know, for charities that you see, 
and make you know informative news clips as well so any of the kind of the, the mainstream media um, but essentially it's it, it comes from a different place uh, if anyone's heard any other particular terms of digital or digitized media I'd be really interested to hear um, because uh, yeah it, I mean it's, it's a ubiquitous term isn't it so the digital storytelling method um, is mostly what I spend my life working with when it comes to my research work. The founders of the digital storytelling movement are an organization now called Story Center. They're based in the US. They came out of California. They used to be called the Center for Digital Storytelling. Um, and they grew out of a community arts organization and in fact have always given primacy to the creative process. But what they've established in their over 25 years of running their workshop format is that for those who engage with the process, this can be the most rewarding experience and it does have a transformational quality. Joe Lambert, some of you might be familiar with him, is one of the founders of Story Centre and is still at the helm of the organisation. And he says this, whilst we do not question the psychological benefit de derived from story work, Ours has not been a fundamentally psychological endeavour for personal transformation. We're not dedicated to long-term reclamation of individual lives. But actually, when you look at the academic literature, it records a myriad of research projects which demonstrate the transformative potential of their particular process. And I can personally attest to that, uh, having been on a three-day residential workshop. And I did find it um, surprisingly transformative, particularly to say I've been working in around learning technologies and media um, all of my uh, working life. So what is the method and what sets it apart? I'm just going to post this link in the chat for you to have a look. Um, I also put it in. Oh, you're on it already, Louise. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, that's, uh, I also put that in the um, information to look at yesterday. So, you know, if you had some time before the session today. Um, so it's in, in that page as well. The first thing to state is that the first person storytelling is the story center way. So it's all about um, helping people to find their important story and creating it in both a beautiful and meaningful way that enables them to take a digital story away from the workshop as a living and shareable memory of the process of creation. First person storytelling legitimizes the process and it brings a great authenticity to it as well. Now, it's a few years since I've been closely involved with this particular community, but I see in Joe Lambert's latest book edition that the Story Centre have reframed their process um, more recently to these seven steps. And these demonstrate just how much space is given to the exploration of narratives and sense making. Um, and we're going to go on to have a look at the, the technicality of how that's um, played out in a moment. But just looking at these, we've got owning your insights and owning your emotions. So it's very much a very personal and emotional um, thing that comes into the process with you. Um, and you have to find the moment and see your story. So, I mean, all of these are whole tasks that they have set out and that they use um, helpful techniques like short exercises to sort of get you in the right frame of mind for sharing the important things. But once you see your story and you know where it's located and you can hear your story because you record it, um, you assemble your story and then you share your story. And it's in the sharing, which certainly last but not least, and this is a very crucial phase in the three-day workshop format um, that the, the Story Centre have pioneered. So workshops can be open, uh, open to anyone to rock up and make a creative artifact. But much community work is actually done with this method, where groups are brought together to discuss a topic or share experiences about living in a place, perhaps. And much of the work is also, also done um, through community of interest. And one particularly good example of this is healthcare, uh, with lots of work going, story work going on in, in this area. Because shared experiences and sharing experiences can be so powerful when difficulties arise. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with that concept. So the next slide shows the three day workshop format uh, that I'm familiar with through my training. I did uh, training with uh, Centre for Digital Storytelling as it was then. Um, and this is the format that I used and adapted for my own uh, field work. Um, but this is widely 
you know, more or less what people adhere to when they're following the method. Uh, please do excuse the quality of the image. Um, unbelievably, uh, I couldn't find all of my source materials, so I had to take a screenshot from uh, one of my papers that it's in, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, but it does show that we've um, got to master different techniques to get from the start to the end of the story process. Um, and I'm just going to run through them quickly. So we've got on day one, the story circle, creative writing and, and the photo editing tutorial. Um, so it's very hands on and full on day. Uh, day two is given over to um, the movie editing software, which obviously if you, you've never used any software, software like that before, it can be really quite um, a very deep learning curve and very stressful and very tense at times. Um, and then on the third day, uh, it's finishing off re-editing, you know, finishing everything off. Um, and then you come together for the final screening, which is the sharing of the stories together. But if you just have a look at some of the activities and outcomes going on in there, um, you're talking about recording your own voice uh, to make the, the story, your editing uh, through the different types of software. Um, you've got to work with scripting and storyboarding. You've got to get to grips with a scanner, although this is probably um, a bit old technology. But still, if you're talking about historical um, photographic artifacts from your family, history, <coughs> excuse me, and your digital story is one of your family um, or a historical perspective, then of course you're going to need to use these kind of um, bits of technology. Um, you're also having to work with learning transitions and how to um, apply music soundtracks and then how to add credits, etc. So in terms of empowering the learning process for digital literacies, it's absolutely up there and it's been really important. And actually, it's one of the key reasons I was drawn to digital storytelling um, in terms of looking at my fieldwork, where I was just trying to find some kind of digital platform for amplifying voices that are otherwise diminished in community groups. Um, so it's a really powerful thing, but a very full on three days as well. OK, so um, just a note on that, the script. Um, I think I might have missed a section out here. So I'm going to see what my next slide is. Yeah, about the, the um, it starts with a st story circle. Um, and this is where the participants would come in uh, at the beginning of day one. And you'll see from the photograph I've got up here, it is literally a circle. And that's really important that it's the closed round. It's an enclosed safe space where people are given their allocated time slot to talk about their story and what's powerful to them. Um, and then part of the power of the story circle actually is after you've spoken and shared your story, is the questions that can come in from the group of participants around you to really help you focus on, um, on how you're framing what it is you're trying to say. Are you saying uh, an accurate thing? I suppose it can be a bit of a sense checking moment if you're talking about um, a story circle of community participants where people might know each other on, or know the context that they're talking about. Um, but ultimately, it remains your personal story. OK, um, so the story circle is oh, keep clicking on the wrong place. I will get to grips with Collaborate by the end of this session. <laughs> so after the story circle, we move into the creative writing process. Um, and, you know, this can take a reasonable amount of time as well, particularly if you're not used to that uh, reflective practice in pulling out the key concepts or the key ideas and the key narrative of what you're trying to say, what the most meaningful and impactful things that you want to record are. Um, and I've got the image here of the, the photographs because um, whilst that's the next step in the process, image gathering and editing, actually the images can inform the story that's being written. So it's an interchangeable uh, part of the process. Um, and the creative writing might end up happening sort of in a quiet corner in a room in a, a workshop situation. Um, you know, it can be a solo activity. So something that would be quite easy to replicate on your own at home as well if you were thinking about um, performing something similar to this online. Um, but then the image gathering and editing a uh, very important part of the process going forward. Then of course we move on to the movie making. Now as it was um, I decided to use the Adobe suite of software to do this because I didn't want the interface to be problematic. I have run 
digital storytelling workshops in further education colleges where we've used the software that's available, so free software. Um, and sometimes because they're not quite as elegant, the interface can end up getting in the way of what you're trying to achieve. Um, so there's always a balance to be had there. Obviously, I know most people don't have a copy of Adobe Premiere. It's a massively expensive piece of software, but it does make everything a lot um, easier. But if you do have access to any kind of movie making software, and I know that all the time, um, more freely accessible versions are, uh, are available. And I I'm not a, an Apple person, but I'm sure that Apple have been doing this uh, for years now, where you could just uh, have download a free app on your phone and, and do that. Um, but it's a really important part of the community process of helping each other uh, in learning the skills to be able to record your movie together. And then, of course, you move on to the final screening. Now, in a remote situation, it might be less easy to sort of to get this up and running. But in the three day workshop format, it's an incredi incredibly important and powerful part of the, um, the, the whole process. Um, I've called, referred to it before as champagne and catharsis. It is, we were hand us a bubbly when we went for our screening of our films. And there is a massive sense of achievement at the end of it. But more than just an individual achievement, a shared experience and achievement with all of the participants that have been through that process with you. Um, and it's massively rewarding. OK. So having described what the storytelling, digital storytelling method, the story center version of the method is, um, in my work, I've concluded that a digital story can be defined as a short multimedia artifact conveying a personal narrative with potential to transform perceptions. So it's more than just a here's what happened. And the digital storytelling method as a creative and transformational process for both the storyteller and the listener in experiencing an intimate communication. OK. Now, slightly uh, <laughs> not smoothly moving into portfolio, of course, we're sort of getting a bit clint of time. And initially, by the way, I'd uh, submitted this to be an hour long workshop because I thought it would be really nice to work with portfolio and some of the digital storytelling method techniques to try and create an artifact um, very, very briefly within an hour. Um, so having to uh, put this down to sort of a half an hour presentation hasn't quite worked in the same way. So I hope you bear with me with this uh, sort of this brief foray now into purposeful ePolio. Um, portfolio, of course, being able to um, represent a, a, a journey, a story uh, really powerfully, actually. Um, OK, so it doesn't have all of the uh, digital media uh, or, you know, sort of some of those transformational processes alongside it. But the reality is this is available to all of us at any time of the day um, without having to go into a workshop to start building a meaningful story and, and to really enable some deep reflection about what's important in what has gone before and how you want that to inform what is yet to come. Um, so I've just put some examples of how portfolio is regularly used. And of course, not least of which, hopefully all of us working towards our CMALT um, revalidation, if not for the first time. Um, portfolio is a wonderful way to be able to um, show off everything that you've done and built and work towards. Um, and whilst this is not about Pebblepad, of course, I'm very proud to say that I work for Pebblepad. I think it's a wonderful platform that enables some really great reflective practice at the heart of an educational experience. Um, but I particularly like this uh, graphic that we have in one of our uh, documents. You can download from the link that I've added on the screen. Just thinking about what portfolio means to learners and people on a learning journey, which doesn't have to mean in a formal educational context of course so planning and preparing um, all of the work that's happening or changes or experiences recording and reflecting on those experiences is really um, a key part of well reflective practice of course at its whole nature um, but part of building an e-portfolio um, where you can collect and curate all of the evidence and all of the different um, different media forms that show what you've been doing, building up towards um, the final sharing and showcasing of uh, your, your journey, what it, what it is that you're doing. And it's a similar journey to the digital storytelling method where you're working up, going through a transformative process and building towards being able to share this at the end. So um, I just wanted to finish um, by 
sort of going through a bit of a reflection myself because I wrote this session outline in late March when the lockdown was fresh and presented a great unknown to all of us. And six months on, we're kind of establishing this new normal now. But I'm still hearing from plenty of friends and colleagues in university that days are still very long, still very high. Uh, and we certainly haven't been immune from that ourselves in the private sector. You know, we've been responding to uh, requirements in, in a similar way. So having experienced the transformative effect of digital storytelling, the workshop, in a period of great change in my own life, uh, when I was doing my PhD, I can only really highly recommend the personal benefits um, that go along with that, and also the collective benefits to our community of practice. Um, this image conveys the sense of physical isolation we may, may have experienced through lockdown, particularly from our colleagues. Um, the shift in working exclusively online has not been necessarily easy for us, um, as a community and it's so ironic that we sort of sell for want of a better word the channels uh, for this educational work but we don't necessarily want to be living in it 24-7 ourselves. It's been a really hard time and whilst it's great that we're finally getting the recognition as a community of practice that's so long overdue, taking some time out to reflect on it individually but also with our teams could prove really beneficial and a transformative experience. So Debbie that's all I had to say on this um, bit of a sort of positional piece rather than talking about a specific project but I am happy to talk to anyone about the work that I have been involved with with digital storytelling if you'd like to know more or how it could be applied in your context at work. Oh that's that was that was really great thanks Sarah sorry sorry I had to keep annoying you with little um little no, no. <laughs> trying not to laugh at the frogs <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that was a really, really great presentation, and well done you, because I know you had done a lot of work to kind of squish it all down into half an hour. So really, yeah. really good. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I'm sure that um, some of the links that have been shared as well, people will uh, will probably come and pick your brains uh, afterwards. If there, I didn't notice any specific questions, but if there are any questions, um, please do feel to pop them in the chat. We might well actually move to the next uh, speaker just to make sure that we get everybody into time. Um, but uh, we will have a couple of minutes we can stay on afterwards if you do have um, any specific questions for Sarah that you want to add in later. Is that okay with you, Sarah? Absolutely fine. Thank you very awesome. much. Thank you, everyone, for your comments. Thank you so much. That was really great. Thanks, Sarah. I'm going to stop your slides. I'm just going to pop our other slides up. There we go. So that we've got our top and tail slides in there, and then Fiona can um, stop the recording and then restart it.